it's times like this that I know there's a god. Or at least some sort of cosmic force that keeps things in balance. Some thing that looked down and said, Well, giant robots are annoying and teenage girls want to bang universal monsters. What the hell am I going to do to balance this out? Ah, uh, yeah! And so we come to G4 Ponies, which really starts with Hasbro's media expansion. Throughout the years, Hasbro has made very lucrative money off the rights to its toy lines through various animated adaptations. But in recent history, they've begun to cash in big time with nostalgia-driven movies based off their properties. Transformers has been a huge hit. Some would say similar to a hockey puck to the face. They want to replicate this with another G.I. Joe movie and possibly another one after that. And then there's this. Fire. Sir, which weapons? <laughs> then you have the hub, Hasbro and Discovery's brand new cable channel, which showcases studio versions of board games and some original animated programming based off their toy lines, such as G.I. Joe Renegade and Transformers Prime. Enter Lord and Faust. For those who don't know, Faust has been working in animation for years. Her resume includes directing, storyboarding, character designing, writing, and supervising for Emmy Award winning shows like Powerpuff Girls and Foster's Homes for Imaginary Friends. She was also an animator for the classic The Iron Giant and was in charge of animating Sawyer from Cats Don't Dance, which is criminally underrated. Douglas. She also kind of was an animator for Quest for Camelot. Well, we all make mistakes. Wow, who knew Tim Curry was such a big fan? At the time, she was pitching her own property, Galaxy Girls, to a Hasbro executive. However, they seemed to be more interested in having her work on the latest creation of My Little Pony. At first, Lauren was skeptical and no doubt discouraged, but she eventually saw it as an opportunity. Apparently, she had been trying to pitch a series with female-centered characters for years, but certain cartoon-based networks didn't think that would be profitable. Oh, brilliant! It's you! You're my favorite! You are, you are the best! You know why? Because you're so thick! You're Mr. Thick, thick, thickety, thick face from Thick Town, Thickania. And so's your dad. Determined, Faust began recruiting a team of amazing talent she had worked with in the past, including the series' new story editor, Rob Rosenti, creator of My Life as a Teenage Robot and Mina and the Count. Already, the combination of this franchise and this team of producers had everyone speculating how this series was going to turn out. Are you smart, this will work! <laughs> I have no idea! But it didn't matter. The cartoon hadn't even aired yet, and people were either writing it off or attacking it. First of all, I think a few of us stuck our noses up in the air when we heard it was going to be animated with Flash, especially after this. Then there were several articles denouncing the content of the show. A Miss Magazine online article claimed the cartoon was actually bad for little girls, that the character of Rainbow Dash promotes the stereotype that all feminists are angry tomboy lesbians and that Princess Celestia is racist and sexist because she's this giant pure white pegacorn ruling over all the smaller multicolored ponies with her giant white horn. Phallic symbol, phallic symbol. Then a writer for Cartoon Brew was apparently so appalled that Faust and Rosenti were working on the show that he called it a sign of the end of creator-driven animation. Oh man, I bet he completely lost it when Cartoon Network canceled Ganny Tartakovsky's Symbiotic Titan after its first spectacular season, forcing one of the greatest animation directors of our time to work on the opening of Priest and the next animated Adam Sandler movie. What? You've just been announcing that stuff? No analysis or anything? Oh come on, don't you have anything to say? Here's the pulse, alright? And this is your finger. Far from the pulse, jam straight up your ass. Say, would you like a chocolate-covered pretzel? I'm not bashing Gendy for taking the jobs. He's a miracle worker. For the first time in a decade, I'm actually going to pay to see an Adam Sandler movie. 
In public, no less. I'm just asking for a little consistency. As for that Miss article, I think they were digging way too deep for the whole sexist, racist thing. Like, beautiful mind territory. And second, why is Rainbow Dash an angry lesbian? Oh, I get it. It's because she's got rainbow hair. That's cute. But would you have even made that assumption if Dash looked like this? You see, Firefly was Faust's favorite pony as a kid. Don't ask me how I know that. But apparently there was some sort of copyright dispute with Josh Sweden? So she decided to put Firefly's brain in Rainbow Dash's body. Because, you know, rainbows are in the sky. But you took it to mean that she was a homosexual. So you're denouncing the series for promoting stereotypes by drawing upon said stereotype as evidence of your argument. That is the verbal equivalent of an Escher drawing. Oh well, it's a cartoon based off horse riding and tea parties. How far off could they possibly... Not only is the series good, it's really good. Enough to be named the best new cartoon of 2010. And so far, the popularity of it has spread like wildfire. Whoa, oh, hey! Oh, hey, hey! It's, uh, I mean, it's like a koala bear crapped a rainbow in my brain! Basically, we were all so blinded by the My Little Pony stigma that we were ignoring the perfect storm. First, you have this veteran team that is not only responsible for producing award-winning favorites, but whose bread and butter is creating dynamic and endearing female characters. Them and the studios that are producing the show are basically pioneers and renaissance artists when it comes to making this new style of model animation as beautiful and smooth as possible. Then there's the fact that the show is being featured on a brand new channel. And not to make this sound bad or anything, but new channels are, frankly, Desperate. First, they're desperate for content. I love it every time a new channel goes up because they flood the air with old stuff I haven't seen in years and stuff that was before my time or from some other country. But along with content, new networks are also desperate to establish themselves to not only provide original content, but content that will win viewers over. And when in that position, I would imagine the powers that be tend to be a little more experimental. Although I did hear Faust wanted to make the show a little edgier than it turned out to be, but you know, you can't win them all. But really, I'm just delaying the inevitable. A lot of people are here for me to explain why I think the show is so good. Well, I guess the beginning is the best place to start. Now, the subtitle of the series is called Friendship is Magic. Now, if I had anyone else here to film this, they would grab the camera and start running around the house and I would have to chase them saying, no, no, you don't understand, it's not as bad as it sounds. Because, yeah, it does sound bad. I mean, friendship is magic just sounds so sappy and heavy-handed that a lot can go wrong with it. But actually, the theme of friendship is handled surprisingly well, and through the best possible way, really, by starting off with an antisocial character. Not that Twilight Sparkle. Stop laughing, it's a good name. Not that Twilight is a bully or a moody kid that just doesn't care anymore. She's an intelligent pony that loves studying magic and is driven to prove herself to her mentor, Princess Celestia. However, her pursuit for excellence and constant study has driven her to become a creature of isolation. Like every tree stands on its own Reaching for the sky, I stand alone I share my world with no And you know what I like about this? It's believable. It doesn't come out of nowhere, and Twilight isn't just some story-serving plot device. We can identify with getting so wrapped up in something we're passionate about that we would neglect the ones around us, or even ourselves. Ah! Then she finds out that a villain named Nightmare Moon might be returning after a millennia of banishment. 
She tries to warn Celestia, but the princess just seems to ignore Twilight and sends her to a little town called Ponyville. And I have an even more essential task for you to complete. Make some friends! Aww. So Twilight reluctantly goes about her business, running into some very eccentric ponies along the way, like Applejack, Rainbow Dash, Rarity, Pinkie Pie, and... Um, I'm Fluttershy. I'm sorry, what was that? Uh, my name is Fluttershy. Didn't quite catch that. And Twilight gets roped into every reclusive shut-in's nightmare. Social interaction. Why, I'd say they're already part of the family. I can't wait to hang out some more. We are going to be the best of friends, you and I. And now you have lots and lots of friends. Come and play with us. Are crazy. But eventually Nightmare Moon does show up to inform them that she'll be bringing eternal night to the land, wiping out their food supply due to lack of sunlight, but they shouldn't worry since they'll freeze to death long before that. Ooh, she's good. So then Twilight and the others go on a journey to find the Elements of Harmony, a weapon used to defeat Nightmare Moon in the first place. Along the way, Nightmare Moon tries to stop, oh wait, no, murder them with various trickery. I assure you, we are quite safe from your friends here. Your overconfidence is your weakness. Your faith in your friends is yours. Not so, because each trial Nightmare Moon sends their way, a pony demonstrates one of the qualities needed to activate an element of harmony. You see, Nightmare Moon, when those elements are ignited by the... the spark that resides in the heart of us all. It creates the sixth element, the element of magic. So after Nightmare Moon is defeated, it is revealed that Celestia and her sister Luna were the ponies in Twilight's book and the two were finally able to resolve their feud that started a thousand years ago. Thanks to Twilight. Sun, Moon, Twilight, get it? <laughs> and Celestia is obviously proud of her student. She found a way to restore Luna without banishing her for a thousand years again. I mean, something obviously went wrong the first time. <laughs> you wouldn't have done that on purpose, right? Right? Maybe. And so harmony was restored and everything went back to normal. Or does it? Why so glum, my faithful student? Are you not happy that your quest is complete? That's just it. Just when I learn how wonderful it is to have friends, I have to leave them. Spike, take a note, please. I, Princess Celestia, hereby decree that the unicorn Twilight Sparkle shall take on a new mission for Equestria. She must continue to study the magic of friendship. She must report to me her findings from her new home in Ponyville. Oh, thank you, Princess Celestia. Aw, oh, that's really sweet. I'm happy for her. What? Just because someone does a dramatic zoom doesn't always mean something bad's gonna happen. The theme of friendship persists throughout the series, because not only is Twilight learning to be a good friend, but so are all the other ponies. Basically, you have five characters that now have one really good friend in common, which at times forces them to interact with each other, when before their different personalities and interests would have probably kept them at a respectful distance or just downright avoiding each other. Yet over the course of the first season, there are key episodes showing the main six discovering that they have more in common than each other would ever have thought. All of these are life lessons about acceptance, compromise, and kindness, but they're never shoehorned in. They feel organic to the stories, which are also well-constructed and character-driven. Now, you know me, I could fill up a whole episode just talking about one of these characters, so I'll just say that these ponies are oozing with personality and charisma. Just when you think you've picked your favorite, another one does something to make you go, Whoa. All of these ponies have strengths and flaws and mannerisms that just make them pop. And it helps to have some great voice actresses. 
And remember in my last video when I said maybe the voice actors aren't so bad? Maybe it's just that they have nothing to say? Because two-thirds of the voice actresses come from the G3 series. G3 Sweetie Belle is now Fluttershy and Pinkie Pie. Rarity used to be Scootaloo and Minty. And the voice actress for Spike and the Mare was the voice of Rarity in G3's Runaway Rainbow. And just something I find hilarious, Spike has the same voice actress as Cyber Six. Now I think he's cross-dressing all the time. Naturally, all these different ponies leads to some great comedy as they play off each other. And even piss each other off. Here's something I never thought I'd see. Little ponies beating the crap out of each other. But that's pretty rare. After all, we must protect the next generation from such depravity in our entertainment. But although the series was intended for a younger audience, that hasn't stopped it from interjecting some adult humor. Oh, poor little thing. Aw, he's worked himself to the bone. And now the punch has been... spiked! There are tons of references here, from Pepe Le Pew cartoons... to internet memes... Princess Celestia, you can count on... Hold on a second! Eternal Chaos comes with chocolate rain, you guys! Chocolate rain! Lots of puns. Hey there! Welcome to Appaloosa! And someone's a fan of Benny Hill. But most of Fim's humor relies on timing and physical expression. It's a huge throwback to classic animation where the movements, speech, and actions of each character are just as funny as the payoffs, which can often include a fall and heavy impacts. Incidentally, I found out that Studio B, one of the animation companies for the show, used to work on Eek the Cat. I have no idea if anyone from that show is working on this one, but the impacts seem just as brutal. Nasty. And there's at least one point in the series where each of the ponies goes through a mental breakdown. Which is always fun. Well, we can't just leave Rarity like this. She'll become a crazy cat lady! She only has one cat. Give her time. But really, these ponies are tough. And they need to be to handle all the bad stuff that goes on. And Twilight and the girls serve as a kind of task force for Celestia. Usually they deal with some kind of monster, like dragons, hydras, greedy dog people, a plague of ravenous insects, and most recently... <laughs> you, you should see the looks on your faces. Priceless. <laughs> Give us our wings and horns back! You'll get them back in good time. I simply took them to ensure there's no cheating. You see, this is the first rule of our game. No flying and no magic. Yes, that's John DeLancey, who played Q on Star Trek Generations, basically playing Q from Star Trek Generations. Two things I forgot to mention in my last review. Sea ponies and music. I have nothing to say about the sea ponies, really, other than sometimes they show up and sing a song. Which brings me to my second point. Music has always been a tradition in My Little Pony. G1 and G2 had lots of songs, and they were either uninspired or the biggest WTF moments of the series. So you can imagine my chagrin when I found out there were songs in this series, too. I said to myself, this is going to suck. Well, you can thank Daniel, Stunt Dogs Ingram, for proving me wrong. The songs he's made for this series are catchy as hell. And again, you can thank the voice actresses for doing such a great job. But really, the best endorsement I can give you is to tell you to just watch the show. I mean, I know you have the internet, and I know what you do all day. It's not hard to find an episode. This is illegal, you know. But even that's hard to say, because appeal, humor, these things are relative. But at least now maybe you'll know what to look for if you want to take a second glance. 
Or even if you have no desire to do that, maybe now you'll understand why so many people like a little girl's cartoon. Oh, who the fuck am I kidding? What people wanted was an easy target. And people will continue to look for an easy target, even if they have to fabricate it. I speak, of course, of bronies, otherwise known as a growing number of men in love with the show My Little Pony. Yes, that My Little Pony. I'm not asking you to become a brony or pick a sister. I'm just trying to get you to understand that maybe things go beyond the first glance. And I'm talking to all the G4 fans, too, who keep talking smack about the older series. Because, in a way, they all played their parts, too. The first My Little Pony got little girls excited about fantasy, and not as in imagining themselves as some sort of damsel in distress way. The second series gave the ponies personalities and passions, and even though all roads led to makeup and a new dress, it did promote that there are many different ways to be a girl, and therefore, many different ways to be a person. Something they new series champions. G3 was... Yeah, um, experimental, that's it. It was the rise of the prototype Pinkie Pie and Scootaloo. Stupid babies need the most attention. Lauren Faust created a show based around her adventures she made up with her ponies as a kid, and I think that is something very special. Which is why it's kind of sad to see her go. Beg pardon? Oh yeah, you didn't hear? She's, she's leaving the show. Yep, I guess she just couldn't handle the glamorous lifestyle. Uh, late night parties at celebrity homes, the jet set weekends to exotic locations. Because that's what happens when you become successful at animation, isn't it? Isn't it? Now what do we do? Uh, panic? <laughs> but calm down. She's still a creative consultant, and has left the show in good hands. Besides, this will give her time to focus on her dream project, Galaxy Girls. And fans should really support that. No, I mean they should literally give money to that. Go to galaxygirls.com and buy something. I tried to buy some pens, but the store said they were all out. But until you see an animated series about planetary-themed roller skaters, who fight a mad scientist named Creatorface, contact me, we'll brainstorm. Let us pony fans be grateful for what she and her crew did. Come on, every pony, let's frolic. Get a job, you hippies. <laughs>